Hi everyone, my name is Manisha and I want to thank the KD Cook uh, and Raj and Athena for inviting me here today. It's very exciting to be here to talk about this topic, which I, uh, it's very close to my heart and this is something I feel all of us in the room are really passionate about. And what I'll be talking to you today is not something new, actually the um, some of the evidence that I'm going to be showing you has been published by the experts in this room. So uh, my charge here is to set the stage for this conference. Why are we here and why is this important for us to discuss? These are my disclosures. All right, so the objectives for, talk, uh, for my talk today are to understand the prevalence of symptoms, understand the impact of symptom burden in patients on dialysis, and lastly, why should we care about these person-centered outcomes? So I'll start with a case, and this is something most nephrologists in the room might have encountered or heard something similar. So Ms. Viet is a 68-year-old woman. She's been on hemodialysis in center for six years. She has history of uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension. When you're running in the dialysis clinic, uh, she complains to you about pain in both feet, describes it as walking on needles and rates it as eight out of 10. And this has really impacted her social life. She used to be very active in her church, used to go for walks with her social group and participate in her grandkids activities. And now all of these are very limited. Her monthly labs look good, except for serum phosphorus, which is high. And you're trying to discuss a uh, low phosphorus diet with her, but all she wants to talk about is her pain. And this is something that's very common. And similar to pain, our patients who are on dialysis suffer from a lot of other symptoms. And I just put some quotations here and I will leave it up here a minute for everyone to read. So this is a whole range of physical and uh, mental uh, health symptoms that our patients suffer from. And on average, patients on in-center hemodialysis report minor symptoms. From here on, most of my talk is going to be focused on in-center hemodialysis patients. We uh, have very limited understanding of these symptoms and we have even lesser understanding in our home dialysis uh, patients. But most common symptoms in both these groups are physical symptoms. And at least 50% of patients on dialysis report fatigue, muscle weakness, dry skin, poor sleep, pain, and muscle cramps. And the mental symptoms that kind of come up to the top and have been reported by almost 30 to 40% patients are depression and anxiety. And the two most severe symptoms are pain and fatigue. And I'll talk a little bit more about these symptoms. Many of these symptoms often coexist as clusters and their, and their manifestations overlap. And unfortunately, these are often under-recognized, under-reported, and under-treated. And, you know, traditionally, we've all been taught that um, the indication for starting dialysis is not last, is uremic symptoms. And this is something um, that's out there in the guidelines, but um, very few studies have looked at whether symptoms actually do improve after starting dialysis. Um, and there's a small study, Matt Rivera here uh, did the study in patients who were followed longitudinally and they were asked to complete a kidney disease quality of life survey. And these patients, uh, 30 of these patients went on to hemodialysis, two went on to PD, and their symptoms before and after initiation of dialysis were compared. And there was no change in the overall symptom burden. The only two symptoms that did show some improvement were physical functioning and shortness of breath. 
But a lot of the other symptoms, especially fatigue and pain, which are the two most common and most severe symptoms, did not improve. So it's not surprising when there have been cross-sectional studies evaluating the prevalence of, dialysis, uh, of symptoms in CKD patients not yet on dialysis, patients on dialysis and kidney transplant, that we don't see a lot of difference. And the, there's a similar prevalence of these symptoms in CKD and dialysis patients, especially fatigue, pain, poor sleep, sexual dysfunction, and dry skin. Fatigue is the most common and second most severe symptom reported in dialysis. And it has a prevalence of almost 70% in CKD and dialysis. And this is for both hemo and PD patients. It's less prevalent in kidney transplant, but still reported by almost 50% of our patients. And pain is reported to be one of the most severe symptoms in dialysis, and it's uh, present in almost 40 to 50% patients, whether they're on um, dialysis, have had kidney transplant, or have not yet started dialysis. <laughs> So I'll spend a little bit more time on fatigue and pain because these come, rise up to the top in almost every study that has looked at these. And fatigue is almost universally present. And its severity is very similar to those of patients with advanced cancer. There are multiple, multiple etiologies and why our patients have pain and there might be overlapping symptoms with some of the other psychological and physical symptoms. And the uh, huge challenges in understanding fatigue and its etiology is that there's a lot of variation. Our group did a study in which we examined fatigue uh, and other symptoms throughout the day for seven consecutive days. And the reason is that these symptoms we know might change. So patients received a phone call four times a day for seven consecutive days, and during each phone call they were asked a uh, um, has to rate their about 20 symptoms on a Likert scale. And through this ecological momentary assessment activity, what we saw is that fatigue, sleepiness, and exhaustion, um, which are shown on this graph, had a lot of variation. The solid blue rep line represents the, the symptoms on a non-dialysis day, and the dotted line represents symptoms on dialysis day. So the symptoms are higher on a dialysis day, and even as the day goes on, so from the time the patient wakes up to noon to 6 p.m. and then uh, till bedtime, throughout the day, the uh, severity of these symptoms increases. And a lot of work uh, has been done on post-dialysis fatigue in our patients on hemodialysis, but there's really very limited work on evidence uh, of treatments that really work for fatigue in general in this population. <coughs> One of the other big symptoms our patients suffer from is pain. And pain, again, there are multiple, multiple etiologies. Some may be because of their underlying disease. For example, if patients have advanced diabetes and have diabetic neuropathy from them, um, that might be causing their pain. It may be because of complications of uh, being a kidney disease patient. So renal osteodystrophy may cause bone pain. And then lastly, it may be because of the treatment that they're receiving. So patients on hemodialysis might report pain when the needles are put in for their access, and PD patients may report pain with infiltration, uh, sorry, with installation of PD fluid. And then multiple and overlapping types of pain may be there. So neuropathic pain, which is tingling and numbness. Um, there might be nociceptive pain, which is more musculoskeletal pain or patients might have both of these. And there are very limited safe pharmacological treatment options for pain. And a um, big reason for this uh, is because of the limited evidence on safety and fear of um, using acids in these patients. And what has happened over the years is that this has led to overuse of opioids chronically in this, uh, in this population. And these opioids are associated with falls, fractures, hospitalizations, and mortality. So what we really need is um, to look into more research which looks at other non-pharmacological options for treating pain, or maybe even safer pharmacological options. 
Because of this symptom burden, it's not surprising that our patients report poor health-related quality of life, which is associated with their limitations in work, family, and social life, and really interferes with participation in life and decreases life satisfaction. It's associated with increased hospitalizations, shortened dialysis treatments, and mortality. And one way I think of this is that there are all these symptoms, and I just put depression, fatigue, and pain up there, but there might be many others like poor sleep, anxiety, uh, that can be included in this circle. And these all contribute to poor health-related quality of life for our patients. And then there might be a bi-directional relationship of these symptoms with poor adherence to medications, dialysis treatment, diet and fluid restrictions, or even just general health-related behaviors, which ultimately lead to poor outcomes, including hospitalizations and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. One other pathway that may be playing a role here is the role of inflammatory cytokines. Um, and they may be having a bi-directional relationship. They may be causing some of these symptoms or as may be occurring as a result of these symptoms. And we know our patients have an inflammatory burden, which has been associated again with uh, poor outcomes. So uh, what can we do? And uh, how do we even begin to tackle this problem? So this is something that um, was, was uh, evaluated by the Song Initiative in trying to figure out what are the top research priorities for our patients, caregivers, and other important stakeholders, including clinicians, researchers, and policymakers. And um, they, uh, they did some qualitative work among international uh, participants and came up with these core outcome measures. The one right in the center are the core outcome measures, which are clinically important to all stakeholder groups. The one, the middle tier, are the ones that are important to some stakeholder groups. And the last, the outer tier three, is important to um, not all, but um, maybe some um, stakeholder groups. So the one in the center, the one that's universally important, one of the biggest ones in there is fatigue. Similarly, among PD patients, life participation comes up as one which is important to all stakeholders. And when we try to understand what are the symptoms that are really important to address for our patients um, and try to prioritize these uh, symptoms, uh, some of the work that has looked into this has been done by Raj and Jenny Flight here. And this is a study that was um, done within the scope of Kidney Health Initiative in the US, and patients were surveyed um, for a number of physical and mood symptoms, and they were asked to prioritize these symptoms and uh, some of the factors that they were asked to take into account were the duration, unpredictability, frequency, the financial impact, and social impact of these symptoms. And the top three physical symptoms that came out as top priority for our patients are insomnia, fatigue, and muscle cramps. And the top three mood symptoms are anxiety, depression, and frustration. So this, these are the things our patients and caregivers really care about. This was a study that looked at uh, patient and caregivers' uh, input on what was important to them. And the uh, one at the top is fatigue or energy. And this is something that's almost universally uh, a theme in all of these qualitative and quantitative studies that have looked at symptom burden. And the ones I have highlighted with red are mortality and hospitalizations. So these are much, much lower down in terms of priorities for our patients and caregivers. So if these symptoms, the top three are fatigue, energy, resilience or coping, and ability to travel, and then some of the other ones that make it to the top are sleep, anxiety, stress, and then um, depression. So if these are the things that are important to our patients and caregivers, then we as a nephrology community should be thinking about these symptoms too. And it's really important because this is what person-centered care is. So the National Academy of Medicine defines person-centered care as providing care that is respectful and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, 
and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. We want to focus on what is important to patients rather than providers or healthcare systems. We want to promote shared decision making and we want to tailor treatment strategies to align with patients' goals and preferences and maximize quality of life. So we really need to uh, have a shift in our focus on what the priorities are for uh, us as providers, clinicians, and researchers. And this is not an easy task. There are going to be a number of challenges to symptom management. I, uh, I'm using an, an example of pain here, but this could be probably applied to any symptom um, that our patients suffer from. So there are patient related, there are provider related factors. Um, nephrologists don't receive training on how to assess for or treat these symptoms. And as Raj mentioned, there's a lack of nephrologist ownership of, the, of symptom management, who really owns and is responsible for treating these symptoms. There's unfamiliarity with safety, efficacy, and digestibility of some of the medications, and hesitancy to prescribe some of these medications, especially opioids, for pain. Some of the patient-related factors that make it really challenging are the multifactorial etiologies of these symptoms, there might be some coexisting physical and psychosocial symptoms. There might be a fear of addiction to some of these meds, especially opioids. Polypharmacy, so a lot of our patients are on eight to 10 medications every day and they don't want another pill. And then there's very limited non-dialysis time for our in-center hemodialysis patients, which makes it really challenging on how to make it make non-pharmacological options available and accessible to them. And lastly, there are a lot of system level barriers that we need to think about, and, uh, which make it hard. Uh, one of the big ones in my mind is care fragmentation. What we do in dialysis clinics is uh, so isolated from what care the patient is getting from their primary care provider or other specialists. There's lack of quality incentives for the nephrologists and there's lack of evidence and guidelines and then limited access to non-pharmacological options. So but during the next two days, I would encourage you to really uh, reimagine the framework of symptom management and how we're going to be addressing this important uh, problem. And again, using an example of pain, you wanna think about medications that might be safer options or have proven efficacy for our patients. We want to think of psychosocial behavioral options, uh, including cognitive behavioral therapy or management of um, depression and anxiety. We want to think of some physical options such as exercise and yoga or uh, physical therapy that might be beneficial for our patient. And, thus, and then lastly, we want to think about some health system changes that might be important, including care coordination, education for PCPs and nephrologists, and then uh, including patient reported outcomes as quality metrics uh, for us. And this, all this is based on a strong framework of frequent assessments with validated instruments and then tailoring the treatment specific to the individual patient. So in summary, person-centered outcomes are important to patients even more so than survival. So these should be important to us too. And patients with kidney disease have a very high symptom burden, which lead to poor outcomes. And symptom profile is likely different, though not very well described for home dialysis patients, and we need to study that more. Assessment and management of patient-reported symptoms should be an integral part of care for patients with kidney disease. And newer interventions and models of care are needed to optimize person-centered outcomes. And I will leave you with this quote um, by, Dr. Sir, uh, by Sir William Osler. A good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So we want to think of our, um, our patients and people on dialysis and not just uh, their kidney disease. Thank you.